company that was set up earlier this year, uh, concentrating predominantly on mission critical systems. These are systems that the police, the fire service, the emergency services and the military tend to use. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, as I said, the company's based in Tersis, which is about 90 kilometers away from here. Um, I've had 30 years experience with the military and the emergency services and as a consultant, uh, both in Europe and in the Middle East. Um, I've worked on some of the bigger projects in the Middle East, the biggest security project, physical security project, um, covering the whole of the United Arab Emirates. We'll see a short video of that today, so you don't die from uh, uh, PowerPoint overdose. And also worked with the police and the fire services in the UK for the airwave projects. Okay, uh, the timeline of communications. This isn't so much an IT-based area. I'm not an IT specialist, um, but I'm looking more at the big picture. Um, up until around about the mid-90s, the emergency services and the uh, military tended to use VHF and UHF um, voice systems. Very little in the way of data. Basically, if you wanted any data, you had to go back to your station to get the data physically on a piece of paper. Uh, round about from 2000 onwards, there's been a migration towards a digital uh, voice system. Um, most of, well, all of Europe uses Tetra, apart from Latvia, who use P25, which is a Motorola proprietary owned system. Um, it's great for voice, it's very secure, it's very resilient. Uh, not so great with data, though. As it is, round about 2018, 2022, there's going to be a move over to LTE, LTE Advanced, which is specifically for the emergency services. Unusually, the public these days are probably better equipped than the emergency services are when it comes to communications. Um, the emergency services themselves, at the moment, there's very little in the way of data that's actually available to the frontline resources. Uh, whereas the public can use various applications on their smartphones. Therefore, members of the police and members of the fire service and the ambulance and the military, as members of the public, they use smartphones. So the transition over to LTE Advanced means that the user expectation for the police and the fire and everybody else is going to be very high. The risks of doing it wrong, both in the technology and in the project management, are very, very high. It's a very high risk project. The cost of a new system is also going to be very high. And that's something that governments need to understand. Uh, and it will actually more come down to, it's not whether you can afford it, it's whether you can af afford not to have this new system coming in. If we just talk through a standard, in Latvia it's called a 112 procedure, it's 999 in the UK, 911 in America. A 112 call will be made to the fire service or the police, it'll go through to the control room, the data will be entered by the operator who will then start deploying the resources. And that's normally done on nearest resource or nearest officer to the incident or a specialist resource. They will also pass information. At the moment, it's done usually verb verbally. And then arrival at the scene. All of that is fairly straightforward. Once they're at the scene, they'll actually have to make a decision at that point what they're actually going to do with this situation. Um, the easy uh, conclusion normally is to close the incident. However, there are times that the situation is going to escalate. So if it's an aircraft crash, a terrorist incident, uh, these are all situations which mean that you're going to have multi-agency involvement. That means that data and voice is going to have to be orchestrated from the control rooms to the resources on the front line. Just give you a, a kind of background video to uh, something. It just 
relieve the boredom. Because of the critical weaknesses in the existing systems, certain organisations in Latvia and across Europe and across the world actually are resorting to having to use their own mobile phones because their existing communication systems don't work sufficiently well. Um, recently, the fire services of Latvia and Estonia had to resort to using WhatsApp um, to deal with a forest fire on the Estonian-Latvian border. Um, and this is common right across the whole of Europe. Um, the bombings that you saw in Belgium earlier this year, the Tetris system that they had in Belgium actually collapsed. There were technical issues with that and they had to resort to using WhatsApp as well to coordinate their activities. WhatsApp is a commercial system and it's not good for emergency services. This is one of the systems I used to work on in Abu Dhabi and across the United Arab Emirates. Basically, it's security cover from border to coast. As soon as you actually go through Abu Dhabi, your number plate will be registered against your passport details, your residency passport details. And wherever you go, your number plate is seen by these cameras all around the entire city and on the main highways. If you deviate off the track, the, the system is intelligent to actually link your movements with any incidents in that area. So if there's been a, a bank raid or anything like that, the system will automatically say these thousand vehicles were in that area. It cuts down the workload for the police. Um, <clears throat> whereas the general public generally require coverage in the towns and cities for LTE and along the roads, uh, the emergency services have a much greater requirement. They need something in the region of about 95% landmass cover across the whole of Latvia and every other country. Yeah, if I can find the volume. Okay, better? Yeah. Um, the general public tend to use um, LTE coverage, something in the region of about 45% land mass, whereas emergency services need to use something in the region of 95% plus land mass coverage. That is a massive difference, um, which is why the emergency services shouldn't really actually use commercial networks, plus the fact that commercial networks in the event of a large incident will actually collapse. They're one of the first things to go. Okay, the public safety requirements, the communications have to be, and this is right across the entire emergency service and the military communications arena. It has to be secure, resilient, full national and ideally pan-national so that you can talk with your colleagues in other countries. Um, certainly there's a move in the United States at the moment on the first net system that officers from the New York Police Department area will be able to still communicate with their people if they're doing a, an investigation down in Texas or in Los Angeles or anything like that. That would be the ideal situation in Europe as well, so that police officers here doing surveillance on somebody in Spain can still communicate securely and resiliently with their people. Um, the control rooms, the operating systems, those need to be very resilient and very secure. Um, I've seen control rooms that actually use Windows. I've come across a couple that actually use Windows 98, which is not very good. Um, the, the better one and the more recommended way of doing it is towards a Linux operating system. Um, what the staff and the resources want is accurate, secure, resilient voice and data with the coverage so that if there's a forest fire, they can get s service and they can get all the information there. Okay, the technology that goes into mission-critical systems 
regional control rooms. Now, these can be, you can have a national control room covering all of the police. Ideally, the situation should be that you have a regional control room so that you actually distribute your ar architecture. These days, organizations are having to use mass amounts of metadata. So that's intelligence data, information from the passports agency, employment data. Certainly in Abu Dhabi, they could actually link you up to your bank account, where you live, who your electricity supplier is, a whole lot, and what your employment history is, um, to all these different databases. Um, there's also a need for normal telephony. Cellular, there's an, you need to be able to break out of a secure system for voice, so you can talk to somebody at an incident, say a member of the public, so you can get more information. As I said, kind of the radio systems are moving now from analog to digital, and they're moving again from uh, what I would call phase three digital to phase four digital, nearly 4G, not quite, and more kind of three and a half G. And that is what I've spoken about before, which is LTA, LTE advanced. Um, we're also looking at securing the transport of the data using quantum technology, so quantum key distribution. Um, a lot of the transport, certainly in Eastern Europe, is actually done via microwave and private wires. Microwave can be easy, fairly easy to hack and can be very easy to, kind of, um, to actually pr uh, knock the microwave signal off or even block it altogether. Um, this is why there's a move towards using MPLS-TP as a transport medium. Um, other requirements, people are, and organizations are requiring high-definition CCTV. So all the way from the border that you could um, ideally follow a car all the way into Riga, following its exact route so that you can actually s monitor and see where smugglers are going without having to intercept them too early. Um, you've also got uh, radar, so you've got Doppler radar for land-based, so for movements, and you've got electromagnetic radar for seaborne activities, sharing of intelligence between agencies and gathering of intelligence, and that includes mobile phone calls, um, the data, the telephone numbers, and a whole ro uh, rook of sensors. As I've said, you've got mobile phones, you've got vibration sensors, and the list can just literally go on forever. Now, the requirement for LTE advanced for the emergency services is that users need press to talk. I'll take it you guys have all got smartphones. Yep. Um, you don't have a press to talk button on that. Uh, the emergency services do need a press to talk. They need to be able to just press a button and they can talk straight to their control room. They also need GPS on there and a panic button. Um, on the Tetra radios and the P25 radios, this is normally a little red button on the top of the radio that you can activate for a second. That informs a control room that you're in urgent need of assistance, and it'll also open the microphone so the control room can hear what's going on. Users need secure data. They also need dynamic and static call groups. Now, a dynamic call group is one which is set up between maybe the criminal investigation department or the um, unit A of the police or, or the fire service in a certain town. That would be a singular group. Um, static call groups are ones that you actually do ad hoc. So if you have an aircraft that's come down, you need to bring in resources from the ambulance, the fire service and the police then you start bringing together a static call group together. As I said, they need interoperability with other agencies. The new system, the LTE system, will operate around about 700 megahertz. At the moment, that's used for television. And in Latvia, there's no real plan for that to change until around about 2022. Um, and 
that is an argument which is going on right across Europe at the moment. One of the downsides of LTE Advanced, certainly if you want the data to work correctly, is the cell radius, the size of the cell. Um, in a rural area, like the forests around Tessis, you're talking around about 10 to 15 kilometers maximum. Uh, which, just from that, you can imagine how many um, mobile phone towers just for the police and the emergency services that you would actually need. Within the cities, that would reduce to somewhere up to about 500 meters, depending on the density of traffic in that area and the size of the buildings and so forth. Is LTE Advanced actually ready for rollout? Not really. They're still actually debating everything. They still haven't finalized all the, all the agreements on this yet. There are quite a few issues to overcome. Um, you've got an organization called 3GPP and the TCCA who are working together to actually get this agreement set up. Um, and, but you've also got organizations, companies such as Huawei, who have actually got their proprietary system out, which is just the Huawei eLTE system, which is a nice system, but if you need to comply with the regulations, then you will have to eventually change your system. Unfortunately, this came out this week, that every LTE call and text can be intercepted, blacked out, that was in the registry. Apparently, it's been known for the last uh, six or seven years. Um, but it only came to light in the last couple of, we uh, last couple of weeks. This is at a, a seminar in Australia. And it was uh, the uh, company called Ruxcon who actually went through this. The two, two major risks to an emergency service system is that a hacker or somebody who wants to disrupt the system can actually either create a fake ne network, so he can actually drive the emergency service handsets off, the, off their um, correct network onto a blank network, and he'll give them a denial of service so they can't talk to anybody. Or, and this would be used over a long term, I should imagine, a rogue network where all the voice and data traffic can be monitored. Um, there's no security on that at all. So these are things that the organization are going to have to actually deal with and deal with very urgently. The, the way the system works at the moment is very dis is dissimilar to the way GSM 1 and GSM 2 used to work, where your mobile phone would at one time search for the nearest base station. That doesn't happen anymore. It's a base station that actually tells your mobile phone, I'm filling up, I'm, I'm reaching capacity here, so I'm going to redirect people, which is great until you get the rogue network actually doing that. And that will actually overwrite all the information from the other ones. It'll tell the users that the two bottom masts uh, fully occupied, you've got to come to me. So all the information, he can then reroute all those signals through to another base station and actually start uh, eavesdropping on what's going on. So it's, uh, it's something which really does have to change very, very soon. This is um, a direct snap of the 3GP um, data uh, in section 5.1.4.1 on threats. Uh, I've just highlighted it in red as to what the threats are. Um, I'm not going to read all that out. So you can actually redirect calls, or you can actually block calls off completely. Everybody okay? 
Okay, there are two um, softwares that you can actually do this to actually try it for yourself, even if you want it. These are the two. The researchers tend to use a SourceForge um, system, and that's what they'll actually use to actually research this. So this is where we need the ethical hackers to actually come in and uh, start doing some more research. The Open Air interface is a good system. Um, the openlt.sourceforge.net. These are, uh, as I said before, they're essential for the IT guys, the guys who are very heavily into the programming side, to start getting involved with the mission critical side of life because everything is going over to applications. I've heard that quite a few times in all the, um, the talks today, and it is true. Everything is moving towards applications. Are we okay on that? Okay. Okay, so the back all, the backbone of the network to allow the LT system to work would be an MPLS TP system. Uh, it would give low latency, around about 50 milliseconds. Um, it's scalable, it's resilient, it's congruent, which means that if there are problems that you're not actually sending the um, alert message that there's a problem, a different route. Um, it's predictable. It's a simplified version of MPLS in many, in many ways. The CAPEX and OPEX are far lower. And it's ideal for LT Advanced. It's also ideal f for other things. Because of the cost of putting in such a system, you have to start thinking, who else is it this going to be useful for? It's going to be useful for the police, the fire, the ambulance, the border guard, state security, possibly the military, the Ministry of Defense, for their non-tactical and possibly even partly on their tactical side of things, and for telemetry information. So it would be a government-owned system rather than a departmental-owned system. So this is more or less what the system will should look like. Um, you've got your firewalls and everything on the right-hand side. You've got your LTE on the left-hand side. And you've got your core network server service in the middle. So I just did a very simplified one. So that would be your, your major highway, in effect, within Latvia. But because what I was talking about earlier with the amount of uses that you're going to have on there and the fact that you've got 15 kilometer cell radiuses on the LTE side, you'd also have to put in an awful lot more, probably smaller, smaller versions on the M MPLS to actually share and distribute the network. What I started to allude to earlier is it's not really cost effective for a single operator, such as the critical national infrastructure guys, the, the ambulance, the fire, the police, to have their own bespoke systems. The, most of what they're going to have in the future is going to be a shared network. They're not going to interrupt each other. They're not going to interfere with each other. But they are going to be, there is going to be an element of interoperability. Data is going to be shared far easier. This is just a um, little video about uh, um, border security that I put together. So on the network, on this large MPLS network, which is going to cover the whole of the, the Baltics, the whole of Europe, wherever, 
you'd have physical fences, similar to what they've just gone through. On the physical senses, you're going to have sensors which will actually detect the vibration. You're going to have seismic detectors in the ground. You'll have audio and mobile phone signal detectors around the fence. You're going to have long range, medium range, thermal, day and short range cameras, which are all going to be linked to the border guard, but the data is going to be shared with people like the police because there's going to be interoperability. There'll be things like ANPR, license plate readers, so you can actually detect cars coming from the border and where they turn off and where they're heading to. You'll also have UAVs, unmanned airborne reconnaissance vehicles, so drones for want of a better expression. These are all going to have to be controlled by people. They're all going to have to be fed back to control rooms. Importantly, you're still going to need a lot of voice, but it'll all be enhanced by using data. And as I said, you regional control rooms, so the guys actually know the area, and you actually distribute your risk in the event of a control room coming down, then your operations won't stop. Okay, so towards the end of it, if I can help you, please let me know. Uh, if you think I can help any other departments, again, please let me know. I'm more than happy to come out and talk to people. won't cost you a penny. Um, I can realistically plan and schedule the time and the cost of any large projects, implement, deploy, and realize your goals. So, uh, Paul Dias, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No. Yeah, this it it is untypical. It's not it's not something that IT guys are generally aware of. Um, what I'm trying to do is to actually bring more and more IT guys because some of them are absolute geniuses. I am not an IT guy. I understand the operations, I understand the systems. But th Do you have also something uh, as for the offer for civil uh, usage? This is rather like for defense, uh, for border guard, for yeah. police, but for the household or maybe for some micro societies, if you, uh, for example, would have some living area with many uh, houses, might be in use. Uh, you can. Yes, you, can, you could deploy a system. It's going to cost money. It's not going to be cheap. Um, but it, uh, you've, got a you've got various levels of the system. You've got the wireless level, and then you've got the fiber or the transport level like that. How do you actually bring that back? How do you secure it from attack? Because as soon as somebody knows it's there, they're going to want to try and hack it, even remotely like that. So it... Everything has to be designed with a very high level of resilience. Certainly, if a mobile phone network goes down, if LTE goes down this afternoon, the chances are nobody's going to die about die if that happens. It's going to be an annoyance. You'll go home, you'll be fuming, you haven't been able to send an email or look at something on YouTube. It's an annoyance. If the police radio system or the police LTE system or the command and control system goes down, lives will be lost. There's no two ways about it. So, um, the, this is one of the reasons, as I said, I, I want to get more and more IT people to start thinking about this, because they understand the mechanisms that go on within the MPLS network, they understand the mechanisms within the command and control networks. Um, do you use Windows? I've seen Windows being deployed in command and control systems. 
very pretty. It works until it needs to have, be rebooted every two or three days because the amount of data that a single workstation is taking is enormous. And I've actually sat in the control room in Abu Dhabi um, where I've noticed the control room operator not doing anything. He sat there and I've asked him if everything's okay. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's very quiet. He said, nothing's happening. And nothing was happening. His entire system, in fact, the whole control room had gone into a Windows lockup and wasn't doing anything. Lin Linux doesn't tend to do that. Linux is far more resilient. But, um, yeah, it's, a, it's not a typical area for the IT people, but it, ne it needs the communications guys, the guys who hold the big things. There's one going on in Abu Dhabi next week. Uh, sorry, in Dubai next week, um, mission critical communications. They tend not to talk too much with the IT guys, but there has to be this bringing together of minds to secure it. Technologies are merging, so sooner or later that is going to be up uh, for the IT guys, as well, I'm saying, the sooner future. Because next, next three or four years, yeah. Yep. Now acquired, I think that for the border guard, England, uh, the drone signals also needs to be uh, processed, and uh, so I think it is far away. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you need to be able to kind of th sit down and think about this strategically, and then what are the other departments doing? So it's not just a border guard by itself. The border guard needs to share their data with the police. Sometimes they need to share it with the fire service and other people. Um, as I said earlier, sometimes you don't want to intercept the bad guys who are smuggling things or smuggling people immediately because you want to know where they're taking it to. So this is where you actually start bringing in your ANPR, your number plate cameras, all the way from the border down the A2 into Riga. And then you can actually follow it, follow the vehicle as it's coming off. This is exactly what's happening in Abu Dhabi. There isn't a turning you can make in Abu Dhabi that the camera hasn't got you. There isn't a shopping mall you can't go in, that you can go into that it doesn't take uh, facial recognition. So as soon as you walk into the shopping mall, it's got you. It, it knows that you're there. It doesn't do anything with it unless there's an incident. Or if they're following a specific person. So uh, the technology is there. And it's by 2020, things will have changed so much. So, but thank you for your question. Thank you. All right, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Michael again thank you for very his much. Uh, beautiful Paldis. speech. Thank you. Thank you.